I used to tell my guys all the time, I said, man, it's a big difference between somebody that works hard and a hard worker. I said, if you're somebody that works hard, you get what you want. You might be great. I said, you're somebody that works hard. If, if corona don't show up, like you might kill it. You might crush it. If you're somebody that works hard, if they tell you what, to, what you want to hear, and they give you a certain level of validation, like you might operate in excellence if you're somebody that works hard. I said, but brother, a hard worker, you can take it to the bank. I said, regardless of the situation, regardless of the circumstance, regardless of the challenge, they're wired a certain way, and they show up and operate a certain way because they're being driven by something totally different. They got a certain level of integrity and character that's attached to their work level. Got a certain level of, I got to do this because it's depending upon the people that saw something in me and invested in me when I couldn't see it in myself, and so I got to hold true to that. Like, they got a certain level of staying power, right? And so I got an injury September 9th. 2006, right? And I was telling people, it hit me not in terms of the specifics of the situation because I would never compare it to corona. But the way it showed up in my life, it showed up very similar to the pandemic, right? The way it showed up, right? The way my life changed, the way one day I was on top of the world and I woke up the next day and the world was on top of me and my life changed forever and it never went back to being the same. Right? I love football, man. Like, I loved everything about it, right? I never played a hard day of football in my life. It was recreation to me, right? Like, I would walk out on the field, guys would be like, you see that girl on the third row? I'm like, bro, I love the way the grass smells. Like, who cut the grass? Like, I love the way the grass smells, right? I love the spray paint they put on the field, right? I love, the, I love to be able to compete, right? Because I started playing in the street, light pole to light pole, tackle football. And so once I got on the grass, I was like, that's gravy train, right? I was battle tested already. But I started playing when I was seven years old, and my mother had me at 16 years old in southeast Atlanta, and she took me back to 125 Warren. And at 125 Warren, it was a two-bedroom home, and there was 14 of us living there. And I slept on pallets every single day from the time I was a kid until the time I went to college. And my mother worked a double shift at Wendy's. And the first time I mentioned this dream of NFL, I followed it up with to my cousin. I said, man, uh, maybe we can get our own beds one day. I just wanted my own bed, right? And so my work ethic was predicated upon something different. I just wanted to pull my mother off the double shift at Wendy's. And so when I got my scholarship and I got to the University of Tennessee, be honest, this gravy train for me. Right? You got guys up there, man, like you getting five pair of cleats. You got guys giving you a smoothie in your air conditioning locker, somebody picking up your jock strap, washing it for you. I'm like, bro, it's gravy train. But people would still find it in their mind somewhere to complain. And I would say to them, let's make a rule. Let's never complain about something that we're not willing to change. Right? I said, it's cool to complain about it, but let's never complain about something that we're not willing to change. And you see people show up every single day, and they complain about the same thing, and then months go by. You're like, bro, you still complaining about that? Like, you're still on that? You haven't done anything about it yet? And I got into my junior year at Tennessee, and I was a projected first-round draft pick as a cornerback. I was watching film one day on two big projector screens just like that, and my coach comes into the room, and he says to me, Inky, I got some great news for you. And he hands me the first sheet of paper, and he says, you're on track to graduate in three years. I said, awesome. He hands me the second sheet. He says, son, you're a projected first-round draft pick. He said, all you got to do is come out and do what you've been doing, play ball, Inc., automatic multimillionaire. I run out of the room. I call my mother and my grandmother on the three-way. They pick up. I said, listen. After the season, we'll never struggle again. I said, we'll never miss another meal. And I go out the first football game, we execute, get the victory, get nominated SEC Defensive Player of the Week. Everything's off to a great start. Second game, we're playing against Air Force, tough group, disciplined group of guys. Fourth quarter rolls around, a little bit over two minutes left in the game. Game is basically over. We break the huddle, and I say to my guys, man, I hope they throw it my way. I can make the tackle. We can end this thing. We can get ready for Florida the next week. And the play unfold, and I'm backpedaling in my position, and I see the quarterback release the ball. Guy catches it on Air Force. I'm going to make the tackle, a tackle I've made over a 1,000 times. But as soon as I hit him, something different happened to me that had never happened to me before in my life. 
when I hit him, it seemed as if my soul left my body. Right? It seemed as if everything in me just left. My body went completely limp. I fell to the ground. I blacked out. Had never experienced that before. I hit the ground. I blacked out. When I came to, my teammates were running over to me. They said, Ink, get up. Let's rock. Let's go. Let's close it out. I said, I can't. They said, what do you mean you can't? You always get up, man. You're our guy. We need you. I said, I know, man, but I can't move. I said, there's a shock going from the crown of my head to the bottom of my feet. I can't feel anything. One of the scariest moments of my life. The shock eventually left, but it stayed in my right arm and hand. They brought the spine board out, put me on the spine board. They wheeled me off the field. We get to the ambulance. My father's standing there, and I say to my father, Pops, I got him, right? I put it on him, right? He said, yeah, Ink, but I think you got the worst part of this one. They said, Ink, we'll get you over, run a couple tests, put you in a room, and we'll figure things out. They get me over, they run their tests, they put me in a room. My mother comes in. She kisses me on my forehead, says, Ink, you'll be good, it's football. She cracks a joke, walks out of the room. I'm watching my mother exit the room. And as soon as my mother exits the room, I flip my head to the left, and I can see the head doctor. And he's doing like a little slow trot. And he's screaming. And he's saying, guys, guys, get in here. We got to rush this kid back to emergency surgery. He's about to die. And I remember looking at him, and I was like, like, die, die? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, die. I was like, like, away from me to die. He's like, yeah, die. I was like, what happened? I said, man, everything was so cool like, and calm. Like, what happened? I thought he was just trying to make the situation more intense. And he said to me, when we ran the test, we noticed you had ruptured your subclavian artery and you're bleeding internally. He said, we got to rush you back, take the main vein out of your left leg, plug it into your chest in order to save your life, or I guarantee you, you won't be here in the morning. I said, let's go. And the next morning, I woke up. I had six on my left eye, one incision across the left side of my neck, one across the right side of my neck, twice through my right ribs, cut out my right pec, bottom of my armpit to the bottom of my hand, 350 staples in my body, and it bandaged me from my neck to my knees. This ain't lip service. And he said to me, when we went in to repair the artery, we noticed you had torn the nerves in your brachial plexus. I said, what's that? He said, your brachial plexus are the nerve roots that come from your spine, and they control your shoulder, your arm, your hand, and your fingers, and you ruptured them, and they can't be replugged. He said, so, Inc., I hate to tell you, but your arm will probably never be the same again. Your hand will probably never be the same again. You probably can never play the game of football again. And I'm sitting there thinking, like, man, no way. Like, I put in too much work. Like, I sacrificed for this. I've been working from 7 to 20. Like, I can look you dead square in your eyes. God be my witness. I never cheated. Like, my conscience won't let me cheat. Like, my conscience wouldn't allow me to run to a line and not touch the line. My conscience wouldn't let me cheat. My conscience wouldn't let me do something and not give everything I got to it and look myself in the mirror and expect results from something knowing that I didn't put in the work for it. My conscience wouldn't allow me to do that. Right? Like, I tell my son until this day, never let your expectations outweigh your effort. Like, my conscience wouldn't allow me to cheat. I said, man, surely my career can't be over. And they were telling me the analysis of the situation, and they were like, Ink, if we can just get you to assisted daily living, that'll be a win for us. I said, what's that? They said, one day if you go to the grocery store, if you could just squeeze a grocery bag with your right arm, that'll be a win for us. One day, if you could grab a pen and you can semi-write with your right hand. Now, I was right-hand dominant at the time. If you could semi-write with your right hand, that'll be a win for us. One day, if you happen to get married and your wife could grab your arm and you could walk down the aisle, that'll be a win for us. We just want to get you to assisted daily living. They said, but here's the deal. We got to put you in a two-year process from Knoxville, Tennessee, to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and we'll order you the best pieces of equipment on the face of the planet, best doctors, we'll give you everything you need. I said, okay, cool. What's the catch? They said, the catch is we can't guarantee you nothing. They said, we can't guarantee you after the two years, your arm and your hand and your fingers will work. We can't guarantee you if you go to this thing five days a week that one day you'll get your feeling back. We can't guarantee you nothing. They said, go to 10 people you love and you respect, tell them the situation, and see what they think. I went to 10 people that I knew loved me, told them the situation. All 10 said to me, Ink, don't do it. I said, why? They said, they can't guarantee you nothing. 
I said, man, I thought a warrior was somebody that can start something and didn't need you to guarantee him anything. I said, I thought this is what a champion was. Like, like you could just give it to him and say, bro, let's go, let's do it. How many calls I got to make? How many people I got to go see? Right? What I got to do is some people that are staying in the office, right? And I told my little team a couple of weeks ago, I said, the cheapest thing you possess is your talent. <laughs> that's the cheapest thing you possess. I said, you're going to meet people your whole life that's going to tell you how talented you are. But you're going to get to a certain point in your life to where talent is not going to be enough. Like, I'm sure some people in this room right now that say, man, I worked hard, man. Right? I worked hard and I crushed it. And there's some people that's a part of the 92% that said, man, I worked hard and it didn't happen for me. Why? Because talent wasn't enough. And I went back to the doctors. They said, what do you think? I said, let's do it. They said, you sure? I said, yeah, let's do it. And I went every single day and one day they would have an arm skateboard. They would strap my arm to it. I would do it. I would get up off the table. I would go to the PT, and I would say, man, are you seeing anything? They said, come back tomorrow. One day I would go in, and they would attach something to my ribs and run it up through my chest, and they would have me breathing a certain way. I would get up off the table. Man, are you seeing anything? And come back tomorrow. And one day I went in, and I'm sitting there, and they got this contraption. I'm doing it. I'm trying to pull my arm in, and I get up off the table, and I said, man, are you seeing anything? And my PT goes to walk off. And this is my guy. And I jog over to him, and I grab his shoulder, and I slowly turn him around. And he was crying. And I'll never forget he said to me, Ink, I'm sorry, man. He said, we want it to work. I said, I do too, brother. He said, I'm sorry, man, but you'll probably never be able to use that arm or that hand another day for the rest of your life. I said, physically. He said, what do you mean, physically? I said, physically, J.D., my right hook is out of commission, baby. I said, I can't catch any intercept. Like, physically, I'm out of commission. I said, I'm going to use this arm and this hand every day of my life for the rest of my life by the way that I live my life because I would never allow a situation or circumstance to define my life. All right. All right. Like I told my guy, I said, man, like I don't get up every single day and I say, adversity, come see me. Opposition, come see me. Challenges, come see me. But when it shows up, I'm like, man, I can't wait till I get through this because I'm going to be a better father as a result of it. Man, I can't wait till I get on the other side of it. I'm going to be a better leader because of it. Man, I can't wait until I get through it. I'm going to be a better servant because of it. There's this quote that says, you go through the storm and you're not supposed to be the same person on the other side of the storm because that's the purpose of the storm. Like when I go through it, I'm like, man, I'm going to be a better servant, better leader, better team member as a result of it. I'm not going to resist the, the opposition. I'm not going to resist the adversity. I'm not going to resist the challenge. My favorite quote is the quote by Dr. King that says, you judge the character and caliber of a person not by where they stand in times of comfort and convenience. You judge the character and caliber of a person by where they stand in times of challenge and opposition. Everybody can smile when the sun out. Everybody can be happy when they're making money. Everybody can be like, let's go when they're closing deals. But it's certain people when that opposition and adversity happen, it's like in football when the game will get tight. In the fourth quarter, you'll see some of the most talented guys tap their helmet. Coach, I need to come out. I need a break. And then you've seen guys that they feed it on it. Like you've seen people like in the midst of opposition, they're like, this is why I play the game. This is why I wanted to do it. I've been waiting on the opposition. Where you been? This is why I signed up to do it. I was waiting on it so I could see what I'm made out of. One of my best friends, Eric Berry, was top paid safety in the NFL twice. Right? Great person, man. I will never forget, I was watching a Thursday night game, and they were playing against uh, the Oakland Raiders. At the time, a few years back, I'm watching the game. He fills a gap. He makes a tackle. And when he makes the tackle, I'll never forget, he hits the guy, gets up, jogs over to the sideline, and he never comes back into the game. And he touched me after the game, and he says, Big bro, did you see the game? I said, absolutely. But what I didn't notice, you didn't go back to the game, man. What happened? 
He said, yeah, Ink, when I hit that guy, I felt as if something was in my chest. He said, so they're going to send me back to Kansas City, get some tests ran, man. We're going to see what's up. They run the test. Long story short, they found a mass in his chest the size of a softball. They said, we're going to send you to cancer, whatever the case may be. Send him to Atlanta, diagnose him with cancer, lymphoma. He has to start chemo. I never forget, we were in church one day. And he comes to me in church and he says to me, hey, Ink, can you find somebody with a hat? He said, man, I'm scratching starting to come out. Scratch my eyebrows, and my eyebrows are starting to come out. Like, I'm going to stand here, can you find somebody with a hat? Just bring me a hat real quick so I can put it on my head. And I'm watching him, right? He's doing chemo, and I'll never forget the day. He was leaving chemo, and he was in a van, and the guy said, all right, man, you want me to take you to the house? He said, no, take me to the track. And the guy said, man, you just left chemo. He said, yeah, take me to the track, man. I got to do my routine. He said, bro, you just left chemo. You need to go home, rest up, man. You was just puking like you need to chill out. He said, no, man, take me to the track. He said, I need to run my 400s. And he got to the track, and he was running his 400s. And as he's running his 400s, he's crying. And he's saying, I'm crying not because I'm in so much pain. I'm crying because I'm not who I used to be but I know one day I'm gonna come back stronger than I used to be. And he came back that year, NFL comeback player of the year, NFL defensive player of the year. And I asked the young athlete, I said, do you think that had anything to do with his talent? He said, yeah, that was all talent. I said, he talented. I said, but that was essence. That was who he was. I guess some people, they're just fighters, man. Like you ever see them people with a never die spirit? Like them people, no matter how tough it gets, they're going to be there and they're going to scrap. Them people, no matter how tough it gets, they're going to show up every single day and be positive. Those people, no matter the opposition and adversity, they're going to keep showing up day by day, pressing the opposition, pressing the opposition, because the thing about it is we can't calm the storm. We might as well stop, but we can calm our spirit and the, and the storm will stop. Because every storm has an expiration date. And the beauty of it, when we look back on this COVID period, it's going to be people that's going to look back on it and say, man, because of Corona, because of COVID, I couldn't produce on the level that I was capable of producing that. I couldn't do this. It prevented me from doing this. And then you're going to see people on the other side of it, the 8% that's going to look back at it and say, because of COVID, I tapped into an element of myself that I didn't even know I possessed. You're going to see people that look back at it and say, man, because of COVID, man, it made me more present with my children. You're going to see people that's going to look back and say, man, because of COVID, I got to spend a certain amount of time with my spouse, my wife, my fiance that I didn't usually get. Because of COVID, I got to structure my family in the right way. Because of COVID, it made me a better leader in the midst of the opposition and the challenges. Because of COVID, it made me more thoughtful. It gave me a level of compassion that I didn't know I possessed because of COVID. I always ask people, they say to me, Inky, man, how can you be thankful for what happened to you? And I say, the only thing you see is what I lost. Right? Because for most people, with their mentality, when they look at opposition, they always think about it in terms of, but what did they lose? You see sports, you see it on TV. Oh, this person's gonna have 107 million deficit, right? These people are gonna lose 50 million. And I get it, man, it sucks, right? It sucks, man, right? Acknowledge it for what it is. See it as it is, but never worse than it is. It sucks, right? But how about looking at it and saying, well, what did you gain, right? People look at me, million dollar question. How can you be grateful for what happened to you? It's about what did I gain? It's about the man that I was able to become. It's about the leader I was able to become in the midst of the opposition and adversity. It was about the perspective I was able to acquire, right? It was the view that I looked at life with. It was about getting up every single day now, and I don't take life for granted because I realize that one day you could be on top of the world, and you can wake up tomorrow, and the world can be on top of you. Just prior to that moment, I wasn't aware of that. Like, there were some people in the world that probably was crushing it in business, doing it the right way, and they didn't think a corona could happen. None of us did. And when it happened, it shifted their perspective, and now they view everything differently, right? They're going to be different people as a result of this, right? Because I'm a firm believer. Like, a lot of people say to me, man, Inky, he's a motivational guy, this, that, and the third. Like, I never plan to be a motivational. I'm just passionate about what I do, right? 
But I do understand this about life. A lot of times, like, we're adults. People don't need to be motivated. People need to be reminded of what's important. Right? Because I firmly believe in life, people don't burn out because of what they do. People burn out because life makes them forget what they do it. I'm going to say it again. People don't burn out because of what they do. People burn out because life makes them forget why they do it. Like the passion, the energy, and the purpose, the fire, that when they first start something and they crush it, right? It, it makes me revert back to when I thought about one time I was studying the Navy SEALs and they were talking about Hell Week and it's literally hell, right? And one of my buddies went into service and he was talking about it and I wanted to understand what was the difference, right, between the guys that made it through Hell Week and the guys that didn't. I just wanted to know what was the difference because I'm sure when everybody started, like, the purpose was the same. We want to serve, man. Like, we want to do it. We want to do it for the right reason. I get it. It's just like some guys, they want to be college football players. You get in the summer camp, some guys like, bro, this is not for me. I'm out of here. I'm not having a 60-year-old coach yell in my face all day in 100-degree weather. I'm out, right? And I wanted to understand what was the difference. And he said to me, they all went through the same thing. Right? He said they showed up the same way. They went through the same drills, right? They didn't say, hey, you guys are going to be in this water. You guys are going to be in this water. You guys are going to go through these ladder drills. You guys are going to, everybody went through the same thing. And I'm like, well, what was the difference? He said when they started to trace it back to the different groups, when they traced it back, the guys that was in the group that said, man, I want to do this, I'm going to crush it, this, that, and the third, then got in the midst of hell week, got in the midst of the process, and they started finding excuses. Everybody in their group found excuses. The guys that got into the midst of it and said, man, I'm going to do it, let's go, and then they got into the midst of it and said, man, if I got to pass out, if I got to push myself to that point, if I got to push myself to that limit, it's not for me, I'm out. And that doesn't make them bad people, great people. But they said the guys that made it, the 8%, they said before they even started it, they said, bro, it's called hell week. It's going to be hell. We know that. It's coronavirus. It's COVID-19, right? Life has changed. Life as we know it. Sometimes you got to forget what you thought should have happened and live in what's happening. The 8%, they said, bro, it's called hell week. It is what it is. The opposition, the adversity, we got to get up and we got to face it, right? They said, but in the midst of it, when we start doing it, the code is going to be when it gets hard, when it gets tough, when it gets to a point that you want to break and you want to quit, the guy said, I'm going to just look at you. He said, we don't have to say a thing, but the amount of work that we put in, the sacrifice that we put in, the commitment that we put in, the dedication that we put in, and the purpose that we're working for, when I look at you, I don't have to say a thing. The respect level says, keep going. The respect level says, press on. The respect level says, this too shall pass. The respect level says, there's nothing that we come up against that's stronger than anything that we possess internally. The respect level says, if we start it, we're going to finish the 8%. The respect level says it. The respect level says, if I start pressing forward, the greatest lesson my mother ever gave me as a kid, and my mother didn't have much education, but the greatest lesson my mother ever gave me was, Inc., if you start something, Boy, you're going to finish it. She said, you're not going to come home and tell me you don't like some coach and think you're going to quit something. She said, you're not going to come home and say, it's not what I thought it was, and you're going to quit something. She said, God, dog it, make a way. Figure it out, adjust, pivot, have a certain level of mental agility, and get it done. Because in this day and time, it's not just about us. It's about the people that we work with every single day. It's about our families. It's about our children. And it's about the people that's watching us navigate through opposition. Right? I want to leave you with something. It's a story that happened with me and my son. Right? And it's like a Christmas ago. And me and my wife was out Christmas shopping. And I'm just walking, right? I'm just walking through the store. My wife is really doing the shopping. I'm praying, really, she don't spend too much money, right? Doing what men do, right? And I'm walking, doing my thing, and I walk up on um, like two little four-wheelers, right? Little ATV deals, right? And I see him, and I get hype, right? And my wife, a couple yards away from me, and I'm like, hey, babe, four-wheelers. And she's like, no, they're dangerous. 
I was like, man, I got to walk around the store, get a purse or something. Maybe she'll give in, right? I walked around. I got her a purse. She gave in. I got her, right? Christmas Day, we wake up. The girls all in the room, my mother, my wife, my daughter, my sister. And I go out early, and I, I, you know, I turn on the little four-wheelers. I crank them up, you know, let them owl up. And me and my son was in a room, but the room that we walk by, we can look out of the window, and you can see the four-wheelers. Right? And we're walking, and we're going to the room where the presents are. And my son taps me. He says, hey, Dad, I want to go out with the four-wheelers. Right? I want to go out with the little, little bike things, as he called them. I was like, bro, you don't want to go with the girls? He's like, no, nah, I want to go out to the... I was like, all right, let's go. I tell my wife, hey, babe, we're going out, and we go out, and... You know, I already know what time it is. I got one arm, you know what I'm saying? So I got the first aid kit. I got the Vaseline. I got the knee pads, elbow pads, the helmet. I know it can, it's, it can possibly get real, right? And so we go out, we strap it up, and my wife comes out, right? And she's really not feeling it, but she got to act like she's feeling it. And I'm like, babe, let's check your boys out. I was like, get us a picture. She's like, shut up. He takes the picture, right? And I start teaching my son, right? And I'm like, Ink, we're going to get on this. And I said, the way I teach my children, I teach them in cold words, right? And the, way, the reason I teach them in cold words is because if we're out and I give them a cold word and the situation gets intense really quick, I can say the cold word, they can associate it with what I'm talking about, and we can adjust the pivot. And so we're on, and I say, Ink, you're going to sit on the seat. I'm going to sit on the back rat. And I say, the first two cold words are light and heavy. I said, when I say light, we're going to ride ink, light, you barely press it, we wave, give you a little presidential wave, let them take their pictures, their video, and we're all good. I said, now when I say heavy, you pedal to the metal, you full throttle, you mash it, right? We scream, we fist pump, we sing, we do our thing, right? Got it? Got it, Dad. We start riding, light and heavy, he's getting it. I said, now the next two cold words are skinny and wide. This is how we're going to turn. I said, son, when you're on here by yourself, you can turn skinny, you're all good, you can do your thing, you'll be safe, you'll be in the clear. I said, but when I'm on the back rack, I say wide, we turn wide, I can be safe, because if you don't turn wide, you're going to throw dad off of here, and my wife, your mother, is not going to let us live it down until 2030, right? Got it? Got it, dad. We started riding, and he's getting it, right? Light, heavy, skinny, wide, right? He's doing it well. He gets arrogant really quick. So he thinks he's mastered it in 30 minutes. And they turn on music. And we start riding, and we go over a hump. And I say to him, hey, Ink, why? And somehow he heard skinny. And he whips it. And sure enough, when he whips it, I come off the back. And in midair, I'm looking under my armpit because I'm looking for my wife. Right? And I hit the ground and I roll. Right? And we're on, we're on a big plot of land at the time. And when I roll, I look up and my son has hit the ground. Four wheeler flipped over. Right? I look for my wife. At this point, she's full stride. Coming. Perfect form, jaw shaking. Right? I get up. I was like, ink, think quick. I'm like, man, you got to get your son up before your wife makes it to him. I said, because if she makes it to him, she's going to make him think he got shot 15 times. Right? <laughs> so I, get, I get up. I go to my son. Right? He has a scar on his head, right? He has a little blood coming down, a little drip, right? And my man is looking in the sky like he's looking for God. You know, he's never experienced this, right? He shook up. He's looking like, oh, man. So I stand him up. I dust him off, right? I fix his helmet. I fix his little pads. I grab the four-wheeler. I stand it up. I grab my son. I sit him on the seat. I sit on the back rack. We look at my wife. She's coming. I say, Ink, go. <laughs> he said, Daddy, you want me to leave mommy? I said, son, you don't know what mommy's about to do when she get here. <laughs> I said, go heavy. <laughs> and he mashes it, right? And we speed off, and he makes a little perfect turn. And I said, now go back up with mommy and grandma, and we're going to stop it. Right, we pull in and he stops it and they start giving it to me. Right? Why didn't you stop? 
You always on this, you get knocked down, you get up. Like they're giving it to me. It's reverse motivation, right? They're hot as fish grease, right? You should have stopped. Look at your elbow. Your elbow is bleeding. Look at his head. Why didn't you stop? And I said, the reason I didn't stop is because it wasn't about the four wheel. It wasn't about my wife. The reason I didn't stop, I said, because if I stopped in the midst of the opposition, if I stopped in the midst of the adversity, if I stopped in the midst of the challenge, it would have paralyzed him for the rest of his life. Not physically. From a perspective standpoint, every time he felt pain, he would have retreated. Every time a situation gave him a little bit of blood, not physically, every time he got smacked by life, he would have retreated. I said it was never about the four-wheeler. It was never about my wife. The lesson was to my son, when life knocks your butt down, I want you to get up and I want you to go heavy on it. The lesson was when life deals you a challenge that you didn't expect, I want you to get your butt up and I want you to go heavy on it. The lesson was when life dishes you a circumstance that you can't control, I want you to get your butt up and I want you to go heavy on it. I just want one thing from you today. Every single day in the midst of the opposition, in the midst of the challenge, in the midst of the adversity, to first and foremost never forget that we don't burn out in life because of what we do. We burn out in life because life makes us forget why we do it. Second, I want you to get up and I want you to go heavy on it. Many are called, few are chosen. Get an 8%, right? We are among the chosen few. Go get it. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Got fired up, man. Thank you so much. Thank you, buddy. How about that to kick it off? Inky, inky, inky. Man. Wow. I've wanted him here for a couple years now. And I'm sitting back here thinking, freaking Inky Johnson's here. And nobody knew it. That's even better. I loved, he, you, know, you know, the coolest, he said a lot of amazing things, man. But I remember about something that we aren't willing to change. Is that good or is it good? Inky, unfreaking believable dude. Thank you very much for being here, buddy. Awesome job. Hey, if you enjoyed this, I got another one you're gonna love. It's right there. Click on it. See you in there. I would develop a, the, whatever metric makes sense for the type of insurance that you're selling, whatever lead source that you're giving them, is I would you have to get them into the habit of dialing or out, it's gotta be top of the funnel.